guys I wanted to talk to you um, briefly in the book of Daniel. I don't know if you know about Daniel, but this is the same Daniel that um, God shouted the mouth of the lions when he was thrown into the lion's den. This is the same Daniel who has three friends who called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down to a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. So it's the same Daniel that for whatever reason I found myself reading yesterday because honestly speaking, um, I can I have a I have a folder on my on, on my desktop that says messages, but I just don't want to pick a random message. Uh, I, I want to make sure that I feel that this message is able to minister to you and it's a now word for you. So this is my second time in 12 consecutive years or 15 years of ministry preaching from the book of Daniel. And so maybe it was because my friend Daniel Campbell came and checked me. We did a four-mile run, and I felt like Superman, you know, after the four-mile run. Um, but maybe it's that, but for whatever reason, Saturday morning, I found myself sipping on coffee and breaking down this chapter. So we're in chapter one of Daniel. So if you have it on your phone or you have it in present, that's where we're going to be. Don't worry, I'll read it and you can follow with me. The first couple of scriptures says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, I love movies. Uh, we went and watched Eternal last night. Pretty good, pretty good movie. I like war scenes. I like fight scenes. And so the very thing that I am imagining right now is a great battle. You have King Jehoiakim from Jerusalem, from Judah, and you have the unstoppable, quote-unquote, army of Babylon, the greatest empire of the time when this was happening. So King Nebuchadnezzar, I could see him, you know, blowing the trumpet. I could see him. They're going to war. He besieged. I mean, he came upon Jerusalem. He flooded it with his army. And this is something funny. It says, the Lord gave him victory, o victory over King Jerokim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Kind of sad. You're taking God's sacred temple, right, stuff, and putting it in the household of your God. So King Jerokim, just talk about him for a second. King Jerokim, the one that who was ruling over Judah, he ruled in Judah for a time. And while reigning, he did some detestable things in the sight of God. Now, I know sometimes you get bad at yourself, sometimes for cursing a bad word, or maybe watching a movie that you're not supposed to watch, or saying something. I know, I know we feel kind of feel bad when our mind and our heart kind of goes a different direction. But God's so merciful, right? Look what these guys were doing. These guys were doing so detestable things. This is the king. And the king um, leads the people. And as the king goes, so the people go. If you smite the, the shepherd, the sheep would scatter. So if this is what the king is doing, can you imagine what the people of Judah are doing? So the king, what he would do, he would have ancestral relationships with his, with his mother. That's super unhealthy. Sexual relationships with your mother. That's what he was doing. And if he was fond of a woman, he would violate, which that means the word there is means rape. He would rape them and then kill their husbands and then take their property. It's the king, you know. And so when you see God giving victory to Nebuchadnezzar, then you have to think for a second, God, you're trying to change the mind of your people? What are you trying to do here? Because sometimes we get upset when we go through tough times when God is saying, unless you wake up, you're going to continue in this negative path. The message from every prophet to the people of Israel has always been repent and turn back to God. Because just like most of us sometimes, we have seasons where we are 100% with God and we get our swing of things and then we kind of bring back our old idols into our lives. And this is what was happening with Jero Kim and his leadership. So this is what he did. And then God, for whatever reason, gave permission to Nebuchadnezzar to besiege these people. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 26, the prophet warns Judah, warns Jero Kim, to repent and turn back to God. That's what the word means. Repent means turn around and turn to God. Stop going this way, which leads to a ditch and eternal death and all this kind of bondage spiritually, emotionally, physically, in your soul and everything, and turn to God. We see in verse 2 that the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over King Jerokim of Judah. So sin makes our defeat sure. I'm learning this in my life. 
I've learned it for a little bit, and I'm still learning it out. Now, sin, you, you, might, you might struggle with some big things. You might struggle with small things. But whatever it is, it's a struggle of the flesh. And God is always making me aware, Felix, the wages of sin is death. I get paid every 20th of the month. By the 20th of the month, I feel rich for like five seconds. And then my direct debit start, you know, the mortgage start coming out and stuff like that. But for whatever reason, I work for 30 days or 25 days. I get paid for the full month. The wages of my work is my salary, right? My salary, I get paid for that. So when we live a lifestyle dishonoring God in a way that is unhealthy, he says the wages of sin is death. So we could be sure, just like Zero Kim, it might not be today, it might not be next week, it might be 50 years from now. But if you live on a path that is pleasing to God, there's recompense. If it wasn't recompense, then what Jesus did on the cross was wicked for the Father to do for His Son. God, God addressed sin so much that it took God Himself to die for us, to free us from the bondage of sin. So it's a big deal. And because it's a big deal, God wants to wake up his people. And so, and let me read verse 3 to 5. So, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the Bible says in Romans, is life through Christ Jesus. So, God always gives us a choice. From the very beginning, God has given us a choice. Don't do this. You could enjoy all of this. Just don't eat from this tree. Can you imagine? We still live that way. God has given us all this abundance, but we still want to do the little things that are not good for us. And like any good father, he warns us. So verse 3 to 5 says this. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz. Listen, if I mess up this person's name. Guys, if you're looking to give your children or grandchildren some name, the Bible full of them, just make sure you know how to pronounce it and you get the meaning. So the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff. So this would be like the chief officer. If he were in a civil er service, this would be like a, a chief officer in his department. The chief of staff, the right-hand man, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captive. It says, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Now, I don't know if you ever watch, like, slave movies. And when you take the slave off the ship, and when the plantocracy people look at the, the slaves, what are they looking at? The strength, the brood, the muscle. If you're puny, you now get a lot of money for you. So what the king is actually telling his chief of staff is that look for the ones that are going to add great value to our empire. We don't want to kill them. We want to utilize the gifting. We want to utilize their strength. We want to make sure that they could fit in here. And so they are high priced. And so he said, listen, they're going to pick from places of nobility from the house of Judah. Select only strong and healthy, good looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well versed in every branch of learning. So they got to be wise. They have to have a good GPA and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. He says, look, find some that I can transfer to look like me. Because I don't know about you, but when a, when a king, like when the Roman Empire, the word apostle that we use in the Bible, the word apostle was a, was a Roman term, and the word, it was a, a, a term used for people in specific departments of the empire of Rome that would teach people, or they'd be well-learned people in the area of arts. So they'd be an apostle of art, they'd be an apostle of business, they're an apostle of um, democracy or, or politics. And what they would do, they would take these apostles, and they would send them to the land that was just conquered, and say, okay then, make this land with your ability to teach people the ways of Rome until the empire comes, until the emperor comes, or Caesar comes. And so it's the same idea. I want to train these people up so they can fit in the royal place so that my kingdom could expand. So train these young men. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine for his own kids from his own kitchen, and they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So there's a difference, guys, as we heard the word here, we said they were captive. There's a difference between the word captive and the word prisoner. Now, everybody know Northward? You can't go visit now because Northward got COVID spread up in there, so you can't go visit. But I don't know about you, but you've had friends or families or you know someone that's been in prison. When someone in prison, sometimes on a rare occasion, in the Cayman Islands at least, a little bit <laughs> less rare in America, some people are wrongfully accused and they go to prison. We don't have that much cases here, but they've been in the past. But majority of the time, a prisoner is sent to prison because they broke the law, they're found guilty, and then there's a, there's a judgment. 
And that judgment sends them to prison. So that means their own actions got them there. The people that are captured are captives. It's different. I will you imagine that you're, you are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You and your household. And Nebuchadnezzar just comes. You see the cruise ship coming. You see the battleships coming. You hear the horses coming. You don't know where to flood. There's a multitude of people and you get captured. You did nothing to deserve to be captured. You just simply got captured. And so I want to kind of define that because sometimes you and I are captivated or or captured, right, by generational things that we never had a choice in. So you did nothing, but somebody two generations ago had a mindset that you still carry in the seed of. So all of a sudden you're thinking and acting in a way that you had no idea until you heard the story of Uncle Joe or Auntie so-and-so or cousin so-and-so. And you'll be like, whoa, wait a second. I don't want to be a captive anymore of this circumstance and situation. The good thing is about Jesus, he says, he come to set the captives free. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he talks about the anointing of the Lord. So no matter what you're dealing with generationally, God can set you free. So I just want to kind of pinpoint that. Sometimes we imprison ourselves by our bad decisions. But many times we're captions. You know, we're victims of something that's been at play for years in our bloodline. We didn't even know it. So that's why if you have divorce in your bloodline, you got to stop it and be like, no more. It stops with me. It stops with me. If you have poverty in your bloodline, it stops with me. I got to make sure at least my house is going to be paid for before I have six to five. I got to make sure I at least have one business. I got to make sure my kids at least go to get a minimum of a bachelor's because when I go through my bloodline, everybody drop out of school. We got shift it. And it takes faith and it takes the word that, well, Demetrius said earlier, it takes a lot of hope. So there's a difference, right? And what I love about Daniel, right, what I love about Daniel and his friends in this, even though they're captured, even though they're going to a foreign land, they never forget that they're noble. They never forget that they come from a royal family. You hear it in histories, you hear it in the history books a lot. There's an African warrior or something that remember who he was before he was captured. A Zulu king or something like that. And all of a sudden he goes to the, the, the new world and all of a sudden it doesn't resonate. So he's fighting this no, noble path inside of him even though he's doing something that very beside him or, or very common. And I don't know about you, but if you ever find yourself in a situation where it doesn't look like where you need to be and you have an epiphany of your passion and of your dreams and of your destiny while well, God's spoken over your life and you say, nah. I ain't going to shake this off, and I'm going to be that noble person that God has called me to be. And so even though they were captives, and even though they were captured, and even though they were, were enslaved, and even though they were sent from Jerusalem to Babylonia, the Bible says that the king, Nebuchadnezzar, says, chose young men from the royal family and noble families of Judah. So even though your season might not be portraying of who you truly are, never forget who you truly are. Because that's what's going to carry you through and break you through and get you free in a future season coming up next. A healthy identity will always break you from your captivity. A healthy identity will always break you free from your captivity. Unless you think differently, you're not going to act differently. And unless you act differently, then you're not going to do things differently to actually get your freedom. The Bible says, as a man think in his heart, so is he. So that's why God had to use Moses, who was not a slave, who was raised in Pharaoh's household to free Israelites or Hebrews who are slave for over 400 years. How can you tell a slave, you're the one that's going to set my people free? You can't tell a slave that. A slave have no concept. He's a captive. They captured them for 400 years. And here's this Hebrew boy that his mother thought to herself, this one might be the one. No angel came to her like Mary. She didn't get a vision. She just felt they are, they are killing all the baby boys. And I know there's a prophecy somewhere that said a baby boy, a deliverer would rise up. 
and free the people. So what she do? She asked, she wove a basket, she put him down the Nile River. She asked his brother and his sister to watch him go down the river. And just as God planned it, who is bathing in the river near the palace? A princess. And we never hear that this princess has another kid. Maybe she had childbearing problems, so you never know what's going on in this woman's heart. And all of a sudden, this baby just rolls up. And as this baby rolls up, his mother, his mother is so smart that the mother watched the basket and she offers her help. <laughs> to raise Moses. To feed him from her own biological breasts. But any good parent know, I could only take you so far. So while she saw him as a promise, she knew she couldn't give him what was promised. So she had to entrust her son to a princess. So I'm telling you, don't get mad with your parents sometimes when they in, in connect you to people that can probably teach you something that they cannot teach you. A wise person, a, a blessed leader would say, I took you this far. Her mother said, that all I can do for you right now is give you life. Because everybody killing these young men. So I'm going to entrust you. And guess what happened? He raises up. He, he got born. He, he, he did well learning in Pharaoh's household. He did not raise up with an identity of a slave. He rose up with an identity of nobility. And when he finally found out who he was, it was the right thing to do, but the wrong time. So he fought an Egyptian because he was offended that he was hitting one of his Hebrews, because he had just found out that he was a Hebrew. He felt the vindication of his people. He wanted vengeance, and he murdered someone. He's still the guy for the job, but now he got set back. Maybe God find him. The Bible says God found Moses at the back, back, back of the bush. Moses don't want to see his old life no more. Moses has run. Moses don't want to be a prince of Egypt no more. Moses don't want to be associated with his promise. He's now become a shepherd. And some of us have declined and got demoted. We demote ourselves because our calling too great. And God said, uh-uh, 40 years is gone. You still got a lot of juice inside you. The people who was hunting you are now dead. Go back. And so I'm trying to encourage you today that and when you start thinking differently, you're going to start acting differently, and you might be the deliverer for that business, for a nation, for a family, for a school, for whoever. It just might be you. And if not you, then who? Think about it. A healthy identity will always break you free from captivity. John 8 verse 32 says, And he shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Knowing something means it changes you. And it changes you, and then it changes the world around you. When you know something, it changes you. And then by acting on what you know, it changes the world around you. Let's read verse 6 to 7. It says this, Daniel, so what were their names before? They were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, were four of the young men chosen all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them. So one of the things that the enemy tried to do sometimes is rename us. Try to rename you. Society tried to do that sometimes too. So like the woman with the scarlet letter or whatever on her, you know, that we're the, the A, she's an adulterer, so they mark her as an adulterer. So they don't see her as a skilled businesswoman no more. They don't see her as a person that made her wrongs right. They don't, no, they just see what we mark on people. And sometimes, even though people are doing well, and sometimes we do that to ourselves, and sometimes we do that to others. And, and I'm telling you that one of the lies of the enemy is for you to adopt a name that God didn't give you. <laughs> you need to embrace your name. And your name is connected to a promise, and a promise is connected to a purpose, and a purpose is connected to a people because it's all about destiny. And so what the enemy does, he says, you know, let me, which was common, let me, give them, let me give them Babylonian names. Because part of giving them Babylonian names, maybe they would identify as a Babylonian. Sounds familiar? You might come from Africa. Talk about slavery. You might come from Africa. You have your name. You have your tribal name. You have your, your language. You have it this. Let me give you Williams. Let me give you Junes. Let me give you, let me give you the name of your master. Because now you have to identify as my Property. It's nothing new. So 
I'm trying to encourage you right now because we need to reject the name sometimes the society tried to give us and remember our name. So it says, Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. So let me just backtrack a little bit here. The Bible says in verse 6 and 7 that they were all from the tribe of Judah. They were all from the tribe or the house of praise. Now you are bad mama jama and papa jama if you all come from the same place. Because the Bible talks about that, that, that the kingdom divided cannot stand. So the first mistake of the Babylonian people was to get four noble men from the same house. That know their history. That know their purpose. That know who they are. And we're going to keep them together. It's like in the book of Acts chapter 16, the Bible says they chained Paul and Silas together in a dungeon in the middle of the bottom of the prison. And what did Paul and Silas do all night. At midnight, the Bible says, they sang praises. So you have four Hebrew boys coming from one tribe of Judah. Guess who comes from the tribe of Judah? Jesus. It's powerful. And so they're all from one place. Praises change everything, guys. When you praise, you can overcome a lot of things. If you practice praise and acknowledge what God said and what God will do, it will change your perspective, which will change things in your life. When Saul was afflicted by an evil spirit, it was the praise and worship of a young shepherd boy named David that released peace to Saul. So praise is very important. What the enemy does is that he tries to cloud you with so much trouble that he want to shut down your praise. Because when you shut down your praise, you're starting to agree with his plan for your life. You can't do that. You got to shake it off. Anybody got time for that? So Verse 4, let me read this again. Verse 4 says, select one strong, healthy, and good-looking young man, he said, and make sure they were well-versed in the branch of learning and gifted knowledge and good judgment, and they are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So I put a little note here, and maybe you want to write this down if you're taking notes, or if you're watching this, you may want us to play and rewind in the future. You are assessed before you are assigned. The Bible says this, that the Spirit of the Lord in Chronicles is looking to and through across the earth and see who he can make his name strong to or through. Anytime God has an assignment for you, the first thing he's going to do is assess you. Think about the promotion. Some of you guys are in a supervisory role right now. Your boss comes to you and says, think about who's in our department. We have a role coming up. Who you think might do the job? The first thing you start doing is assessing people. And then if somebody passed the assessment or looks good for the job, the next thing we do is talk to them and introduce them to their new assignment. And the thing about these people were, they even, even though they were well-schooled and well-learned, coming from Judah like that, the Bible says they were trained for three years prior to entering into the royal service. Oh, that, that sounds like a long time. And we live in a very microwave, instant gratification society where we can't wait on nothing. A friend of mine introduced me to cryptocurrency, and he said, don't sell, wait a little bit. You know, my hand itching to, to sell because crypto is so dynamic, right, up and down. And when you see it getting some gains, you want to make that quick money. But it's for the long run. And these young men had to get proper training before they enter into the court of the king, of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar from the beginning said, choose them. I don't want to see them until three years because when they come in my presence, they're supposed to act on my behalf. And if they don't do that, off with your head. Pretty much to the leader, to the chief officer. So training for reigning, guys, is what God is doing in our lives. When we get irritated so quickly, when we get frustrated, when we're still doing that merry-go-round, those bad decisions, God is saying, you're still not passing the test because I want you to be reigning in life. You're not using wisdom the way I want you to use wisdom. You're getting too irritated by what's on my road or what's on the news or what some people are saying. Just stop all of that foolishness. Somebody text me and say, Pastor Peter, how are you so calm? What makes you think I'm calm? Because I'm not posting that I have insecurities, that I'm anxious, that no, I pray. I talk to God about it. And whatever I can't control, I don't lose sleep over. If I'm not responsible for an area of life in this society, how can I, how, how can I, how can I say, how can, how can I feel the weight of the burden then? I can only feel the weight of the burden of what's in this house and what's in my house and what's in the place where I work or anything I create. 
If I did not create it, I am not responsible for it. And so many people are losing sleep over things in areas that other people are responsible for. I'm not responsible for my mother. I'm not responsible for my father. I'm not responsible for my boss. I'm not, I'm not respons I'm responsible for me and these two little ones in here and my wife. And outside of that, everything else is my choice. Oh, thank you, Pastor Felix. That's a good perspective. She worried about this. She worried about that. She worried about this. She worried about that. And I'm like, God, you worry about too much things. And the enemy love that. The enemy love to make you worry about something that you can't make an impact on. Pray. And bless. So training for reading is what God is doing. When, when you go through a tough time, he's trying to train you. He's trying, he trying to make you know I'm assessing you for something great. And how you juggle this, I'm going to promote you. And the promotion might not come in the next term or the next quarter. Promotion will come from the Lord, the Bible says. Because that's the only way it comes. Let's read verse 8 now. It says, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by the food and wine given. So here's the chief officer saying, if I'm going to feed these guys, they're going to have to eat the best food from the Pharaoh's, um, from Nebuchadnezzar house. Nobody eat like the king. The king got wine. The king got the best things. The king got the best meat. The king, And it sounds like that's the best because I love steak social. I love all our copper falls. I love all that too, man. I, I wish I were them right now. Hmm. But Daniel and his friends know something about this Babylonian culture that is very important to them. You see, this whole thing about the Daniel fast is not about food. It's not about vegetables. It's about idol worship. In this culture, before they actually um, gave you the meat, they would offer sacrifice of that calf, of that meat, whatever has been sacrificed, to their temple or to their idols. And, 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 and the Bible says in Acts that that's actual idol worship. And so Daniel says, I'm holy, I'm set apart. I know my God. He's a God of covenant. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy that we must worship God and God alone because there's no other God but him. And if I eat this meat, it's not about the meat. It's a nice cut of meat. If I eat this meat, I'm really honoring idols instead of my God. I was like, wow, I saw that in the text. I'm like, wow, it has nothing to do with food. It has nothing to do with him trying to be, you know, unkind. And it has nothing to do with Daniel being a vegetarian for the rest of his life because it doesn't say that. It says during the time of training for 10 days so that he can get favor with the chief of staff. He said, chief of staff, I know that you're responsible for me. I know that if I don't look good after 10 days, then and I get, you get, we get inspected, guess what? It, you know, you're going to get chastised for this but trust me if you give me vegetables and you give me water me and my friends examine us and you tell me who best that's what he was saying he's like listen i know we're in a boot camp but let me choose my food but daniel's stance like i said wasn't about food it was about personal worship and honoring god it was always about the source and not the food it's the source it's the course connection to the commodity that Daniel was concerned about. The food is the commodity. The connection was the idol worship. I can't defile the temple of God with idol worship. This is such an old practice. Like I said, Acts 15 says, it, it shows up. After speaking to the Gentile church, it says this, Acts 15 verse 29 says, stay away from anything sacrificed to a pagan idol. King James Version says, you know God is the God, uh, one true God. So therefore, don't worship any other God except for him. And then the next one says, verse 29 in King James says, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols. And so Daniel knew that if God is going to reward me in a foreign land, I still have to find a way to worship him. See, some of us feel like the presence of God only falls when we got a church service, when we got a worship going on, all kinds of stuff. No, the presence of God, God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. It's how we connect to him that is important. Important. So we could be in our car, we could be in a board meeting, we could be, we could be in a place in somebody's house that has all kinds of idols around us, all kinds of different foolishness, and we don't have to challenge them and what they believe, we just got to be true, true to our God. And I continue reading, let me read from verse 11 to 17. It says, Daniel spoke with attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He says, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see, who, see, see how we look in compared to other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed. No, at first he didn't agree. 
But when you see sometimes you think people are against you, people are not against you, you just need to explain yourself better. I'm learning that. Some I still make mistakes. Sometimes I, I jump ahead and make a decision without consulting my wife. Forgive me, baby. But at the same time, I'm learning that people are not against me. I just need to explain myself. So Daniel's explained himself. Listen, you don't got nothing to lose. I know it's going to be okay. Trust me. All right? I trust you. We're going to do this. So check me out at the end of 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends look healthier and better nourished than young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. Here's the food of idols attached to demons. Here's the purity of vegetables. Not about the substance of the vegetable. No. It's about they, were, they, they, they weren't sacrificed. They weren't set apart for the enemy. So light is being nourished in this man's body. Darkness is being accompanied to other people's body. So when they examine him for 10 days, he looks better. He looks healthier. God gave these four young men, verse 17, an unusual aptitude for understanding in every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. Remember I tell you, you're assessed for the assignment. It doesn't say that God gave them anything at the beginning of this thing, right? It said that the, uh, um, the chief officer had to, the chief of staff had to choose wise men, well-learned, handsome young men from a royal family or nobility from Judah. It didn't say God gave them anything. But I'm learning it's all about growing in wisdom and favor with God and man. Because your gifting works somewhere. And your gifting work best in the area where God has called you. So not every time you're good at something means you're called to that situation. You might be good at it, but you might not be fit for it. You see what I'm saying? So you have to always work with people and find out, hey, unless you try something, you don't know what you're good at. A lot of people, I don't know where God called me. Have you tried something? Have you tried something? Have you tried sharing the word? Have you tried serving? Have you tried opening a business? Have you tried? If you have tried nothing, you will not know what God called you to. I didn't know I was good at communicating until I tried to communicate. And I sucked at my first hour and a half preaching. But I worked on it. And Jesus says this in Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So here is Daniel and his three friends. God is rewarding their obedience and sacrifice. Now, I know that some of us feel like God does not reward obedience and sacrifice. I'm telling you, he does. The Bible says obedience is also better than sacrifice. What does that mean? Even when it's tough, still do what God says. Because sacrifice means that, okay, God, I saw it. I don't give this as a sacrifice. Right now, I'm giving this as a sacrifice. And I've been churching 10 weeks. I don't give this as a sacrifice. God, I did this. Let me give this as a sacrifice. And God, like, I don't need your sacrifice, you know. I really need your obedience. And when I get your obedience, things will start to flow. So here's these young men, distant from their physical land, but still in the presence of God. And they made a stand from an early spirit, like, I'm going to be wise, but I'm not going to be wise in your terms. I'm not dishonoring to Babylon. I'm not against it, but I'm going to trust God in this foreign land. And the Bible says God gifted them with understanding and aptitude. So God rewards your obedience and sacrifice. Never second guess it. After the time of testing, God releases grace and gifts to Daniel and his friends. Now that's why you f that's why you feel you could feel the anointing of God when you go through a tough season. You could feel that you're wiser. Look back at 2019, what you overcame. I'm wiser in a relationship. I'm wiser in my finance. I'm, I, I'm more powerful because God, you passed the test, and all of a sudden there's a grace that is released. Right, Nikolai? There's a grace that is released as you pass the test. But if you don't, you, you don't, you don't subject, yourself to that, subject yourself to that process, you never grow. Because you run from everything instead of face it. A lot of people are 60 and still 20, you know, because they run from everything. Any time a season won't get tough, they run. And they create the same confusion and the same drama in a different place. God says, stop it and face it, Goliath, so that I can do something great in your life. Let me continue reading verse 18 to 21. It says, when the training period ordered by the king was complete, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, bad company. 
corrupts good character. That's why if you hang around with fools, you become a fool. I talked about my friend who does cryptocurrency. I know nothing about it, but I'm telling you, two, three years from now, I might know something about it. Because I'm talking to him at least an hour a week about it. We're shy, arpening, sharpen, uh, iron sharpening iron. And this is the first. No, no, it's something beautiful when you hear somebody introducing you to something that five to ten years from now could financially bless you in a way that you could never dream or imagine. That's a true friend, you know. That's a true person that wants you, boy, I don't know, it might happen like this. I'm trusting if you put a little, they try in. And, and, and you know what it does too? When you know some, when somebody invites you, say, this is what I have made. This is what I know. So you know when somebody show you the fruit of what they're learning and they say, try it, feel it, just try it for a little bit. I want to see you blessed like this. Oh, that's a good friend, you know. And the friend doesn't have to follow Jesus. It's all bad for me to say that. But sometimes we make people, like, how can I say this? We make people who are in their transition of spiritual development and growth, if they're not fully, like, think like us, we feel like we can't associate with them. But I'm here to tell you that Daniel, the Bible says, at the end of this, that Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of King Cyrus. I googled the king of Babylon. I googled him. You know how much years between Nebuchadnezzar and the first year of Cyrus was? 60 years. 60 years, Daniel stayed faithful to God in a foreign land. God will use people that don't know him to bless you. Once you don't become like them. Once you don't become defiled. Once you realize, okay, you got to learn from them. Learn what they not do. I mean, he was able to serve. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 verse 7, it says, make yourself at home there. Talking about Babylon. Jeremiah was speaking to a, a, a group of people, Israelites, in a foreign land. He says, make yourself at home in Babylon and there and work for the country's welfare. It says, pray for Babylon's well-being. If things go well for Babylon, things will go well for you. It's in the Bible since we love this book. It's tough where you work. It's tough where you live. It's tough where God said, really and truly, don't abandon it. Pray for it. Know that I can bless you there. Daniel got that. When Daniel was stuck in the lion's den, the first thing he said when, when, um, when the king, a whole night, you know, the people set him up, set him up. Because he, he prayed three times a day and he opened the window and these guys fooled the king and, and said, King, blah, 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 do this. And so the king sent a decree, no more praying, only this God, only that. And, that. and Daniel, because he didn't want to defile himself, Daniel still prayed. And he got thrown in the lions. Then the Bible says the angels of the Lord shut the mouth of the Daniel. And guess who the first one that run down there in the morning to see Daniel? The king. And the first thing Daniel said to the king, Lord, I'm well. God spared me. Woo! Nebuchadnezzar went crazy for his wrongdoings like a wild man for seven years and Daniel got the dream to interpret it for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's, um, Daniel's perspective to, um, to Nebuchadnezzar was, Lord, I hope it wasn't so. I hope it's not you. I don't even want to tell you interpretation. He loved the king so much. He didn't even want a king to go through this tough season. And at the end of the king's season where his wildness was removed and he got his senses back and the Lord restored Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Daniel, God, going to be my God. Are we living in such a way, in a world that might look chaotic, that people who need a compass more or less spiritually, who need breakthrough, would look at us and say, Star, Demetrius God will be my God. Nikolai God will be my God. Felix God will be my God. So like, are, are we saying that or are we still not sure what we want to do in life? I'm saying, guys, with all the bottom of my heart, God is able to give you a love for a group of people or leaders that might not fully believe in him, but because of your excellent spirit and because you choose a path to be bold and to love, doesn't mean you confront them, doesn't mean you, you chastise them, it means that you serve and you trust God and watch God move on your behalf 60 years in a foreign land and Daniel was the right hand man for four different kings. Persian king come, boom. Who's Daniel? Well, he the wisest man we have here. Let's do this. And the funny thing is, right, Daniel was such a, a mentor to kings that in, um, I think it's in Switzerland or, or 
I remember where it is, but it's in, in a country's Geneva Convention. You ever heard of Geneva Convention? So the Geneva Convention is like a convention of laws and precepts and principles where we get some of our m similar justices, our very neutral foundational justices uh, and laws that people adapt over the times of, uh, of years and stuff like that, right? Um, the king that actually started some of the very, 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 very seed form principles for that that was adopted over years was Silas, or Cyrus, King Cyrus, I think. Yeah, Cyrus. King Cyrus, the very last king that he served, was the king that began to change things in the judicial system. And guess who served Cyrus? Daniel. You don't know. You might not be the number one person, but the number one person might need your wisdom. And you might have influence and insight that they need and they will adopt because of the relationship currency that you have that generations go by might change the constitution of Cayman. Might change the constitution of your workplace. Might change the actual way your family do business and do life. You never know. You don't have to be number one to make an impact. But you have to serve. So let me pray for you, for God to activate the wisdom that he gave to Daniel and to his friends because of radical obedience, even though it was challenging, even though they didn't know really if it was going to be their life or anything like that, they said, God, I want to obey you even when the place around me doesn't look like it obey you. God, I want to pray to you even when it's challenging to even get a word out. I can't even open my window, but I can still find a way to pray. Lord, uh, the person that I, uh, I'm serving is a maniac, <laughs> egotistical, whatever, whatever circumstance you want. Nobody will crazy than Nebuchadnezzar. And if Daniel could serve Nebuchadnezzar, you can serve whoever.